my real pleasure to introduce Catherine Hayhoe. Catherine's a professor at Texas Tech University, and she has a very unique range of talents. First, she's got degrees in physics, astronomy, and atmospheric science. She's an eminent climate scientist. She's authored some major studies that deal with climate projections and our vulnerabilities. She advises our own city of Austin on a city's climate change planning, and she's served on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Secondly, Catherine is also a person of devout faith. She's the daughter of missionaries and the wife of a pastor. Third, she's also a very gifted communicator. In 2014, the American Geophysical Union awarded her its Climate Communications Award. And she's the star of the PBS digital series, Global Weirding, which you can access uh, through YouTube. She combines all of these unique talents to really walk in circles that no other scientist or person of faith or communicator that I know is able to walk in. And that's what she's gonna share with us tonight. But uh, don't take it from me. Here's what some people are saying about Catherine Hayhoe. Here's are some people on the record, public statements about Catherine Hayhoe. Among the most 100 influential people in 2014, does anyone know who, uh, who said that? Yeah, that's right, Time Magazine said that. Catherine Hayhoe is a national treasure. Does anyone know who said that? Donald Trump. <laughs> that was a softball right in your wheelhouse, wasn't it? But, no, it was actually Anthony Lazarowitz, a prominent uh, researcher at Yale University. It's a climate babe. Does anybody know who called her that on the record? That was, that was a... What a nice person. Does anybody know who said that about Catherine? Pretty much everyone I know who's met Catherine. So now to give the 105th Hot Science Cool Talk, Climate and Faith, Money and Politics, How Can We Build a Sustainable Future? Please welcome Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. Don't think I didn't notice which one you laughed at the most. I want to start by congratulating you, because as far as I know, this is the first time that anybody has actually broken the box office at the Paramount Theater. Yeah. <laughs> and if you had told me that a talk by a climate scientist would be the one to break the box office, I never would have believed you. Also, if you had told me when I first started studying climate science, that one day climate change and immigration would be the two most politically polarized issues in the entire United States, I never would have believed you either. Yeah, I'm not sure we should really applaud that one. <laughs> because today it is. Climate change has beat out gun control, death penalty, abortion even, as one of the most politically polarized issues. But for me as a climate scientist, it just seems incredible because a thermometer does not give you a different answer depending on how you vote. At the same time though, recognizing the context in which we are discussing climate change today in the public sphere, we can't just talk about the science. We have to talk about it, how it relates to all of these untouchable topics that we're told never to bring up in polite company. Money, politics, and God. So we're going to go there today. And uh, yep, we, uh, we are. And we're going to start with some politics. I'm going to start with some quotes from politicians about climate and faith. Now you might say, how could you find these quotes? Wouldn't it be kind of rare? No, not at all. In fact, all you're going to get is my top five. I have a list this long of politicians talking about the Bible and climate change in the same sentence. And you might say, well, isn't that a good thing? Because surely they're talking about loving our neighbors who are being harmed by a changing climate, or maybe they're talking about the responsibility that we have been given by God to care for every living thing on the planet. No, they're not. 
Here we go. We're starting with representative from California who said the climate of the globe has been fluctuating since God created it. So we're starting at the beginning. Representative Miller from Florida continues, our climate will continue to change because of the way God created the earth. Representative from Illinois tells us what's gonna happen. The earth will end only when God declares it is time to be over. Man will not destroy the earth. I do appreciate how it's always man. <laughs> Women get a completely free pass on this. <laughs> I could say some other things, but I won't because that would be sexist. And then, my favorite quote of all, God is still up there, the arrogance of people to think that we human beings would be able to change what he is doing in the climate is to me outrageous. What, now don't think, don't for an instant think the politicians don't know exactly what they're doing when they link these two concepts. They know exactly what they're doing and Lindsey Graham, a smart man, actually went ahead and just said it. He said, the problem with this thing is that Al Gore has turned it into a religion. How do we know? All you have to do is Google it and the internet will prove you right. Because we all know that whatever we Google is true, right? And I was delighted to notice that somebody actually took the time, I don't know if anybody has really good eyesight, somebody actually took the time to Photoshop my head onto the choir. <laughs> I am a pastor's wife, but we do not have a choir at our church. We're the type of church that has a band and drums, not a choir. No robes. Why is this such a smart way to frame climate change if you don't want people to take it seriously or to accept it? Because make no mistake, it is a brilliant way to frame this issue if you want people to reject it. Why? Because in the United States, 77% of us identify as one type or another of Christian. And if you are a Christian, or if you have another religion that you belong to, and along comes somebody else preaching a different gospel, proselytizing a new religion, what is your instinct when somebody comes along trying to witness to you, when somebody shows up at the door with, you know, a little elder sign on? Generally, your instinct is to say, no, thank you, I'm fine. And some people's instinct is a little stronger when the false prophet comes to the door. So framing climate change as an earth-worshipping alternative religion to Christianity is a brilliant way to get 77% of the United States to reject this issue. But thankfully, I think many of us who are Christians actually read the Bible, and many of us who aren't still know that caring for other people and caring for this planet that we live on just makes sense because it's the right thing to do. But as a scientist, I have to say, when I saw this headline a year and a half ago, I just about cheered. This is my all-time favorite headline because she says it all. A woman named Rebecca wrote this and she says, you can't believe in climate change because it is not a religion, it is a scientific fact. Thank you. Another scientist commented that scientists do not join hands every Sunday singing, yes, gravity is real, I will have faith. <laughs> and whether or not this horse believed in gravity doesn't matter because if you step off the cliff, you are going down. So let's talk for a few minutes about what we know about a changing climate. What are the facts that regardless of where we fall on the political spectrum, what are the facts that are immutable, that are true, that we know to be true, and we've known to be true for a very long time? Here are four facts. The first fact 
is that climate is changing. How do we know that? Well, we're not talking about weather. Weather is like a single tree. It's what happens in a certain place at a certain time. Weather is that crazy hot summer when you actually fried the egg on the sidewalk, or it's that winter storm that locked us down so we couldn't get out of West Texas. Yes, it does snow there. But we're not talking about weather change. We're talking about climate change, and climate is like the forest. It's the long-term average of weather over at least 20 to 30 years. So between the months of about November and April, the number one question that I get is, usually accompanied with a look like that. It's freezing outside, where is global warming now? But saying it's freezing outside so global warming can't be true is like saying, and I can't take credit for this picture, I completely stole it, the ship can't be sinking because my end just went 200 feet up in the air. Like I said, no credit, I just admire it. The fact of the matter is, when we look at global temperature, and no talk on climate change would be complete without the obligatory global temperature figure, so here we go, it's over with, we see that global temperature does go up and down from year to year, that's weather. But over climate time scales, which is 20 to 30 years, thank you, it is steadily increasing, and we have seen the last three years be the warmest successively on record, 2014, then 2015, then 2016. Now, I'm just going to warn you here. Will 2017 be the next warmest year on record? I'm willing to bet not. I'm willing to bet it's going to just jag down a little bit. Does that mean global warming's over? No. It means that it's normal weather superimposed on a long-term trend. Here in Texas, every single season has been warming since the 1950s, and winter has warmed the fastest. And you might say, well, you know, aren't most scientists always doctoring those thermometers to make them give them the answer that they want? Believe me, I get this every day on Facebook. <laughs> if you doubt any of the arguments I say, just go to my Facebook page and read the comments. I promise you they're there. What if you don't trust the thermometers? What if you don't trust the satellites? If we simply look at the world around us, if we look at sea level rising and glaciers melting and animals and plants and birds moving poleward and seasons shifting and rainfall patterns changing, there are over 26 and a half thousand indicators of a warming planet, many of them in our own backyard. That's how we know that climate is changing. Here's the second thing we know. We know that for the first time in the history of the planet, it really is us this time. Now, you might say, but hang on, aren't there these natural cycles? Absolutely, there are. And so when climate scientists draw this conclusion, we don't just jump on the Church of Al Gore bandwagon and say, yes, it's got to be humans. No, we say, what if it is a natural cycle? Or maybe it's the sun, because these are why climate has changed in the past. You know, Ice Age movies? Anybody seen those? Anybody seen those at least 50 times? If you have anybody over the age of, or under the age of three, you probably have. We've already knocked off the weather one because we're not trying to predict the weather. We're trying to predict the long-term averages. But maybe it could be the sun, right? Because the sun's energy goes up and down. So what if it's been going up for the past while? Couldn't that be causing the planet to warm? It could. So here's the Earth's temperature. The thick line is the long-term average, and the wiggly line is the year-to-year -year values. Here's the energy from the sun. It's going in the opposite direction. In fact, if we were being controlled by the sun right now, we'd be getting cooler, not warmer. What about a natural cycle? Well, there's two kinds of natural cycles. And I know this because that's what climate scientists study. We're the ones who study the natural cycles. The first type of cycle is inside the Earth system, like El Nino. You've heard of El Nino? Yes, just about everybody has. It totally makes my day when a, you know, a farmer in West Texas comes up to me, he's like, Missy, you just haven't heard of El Nino. I'm like, who do you think studies El Nino? <laughs> it's like coming up to your doctor and saying, you haven't heard of germs. And the doctor's like, Ugh. 
So could it be a natural cycle like El Nino? What these natural cycles do, and there's many of them, is they move heat around the Earth's system, back and forth from east to west, north to south, and most of all, from the ocean to the atmosphere and back again, just like a teeter-totter or a seesaw. So if our atmosphere were warming due to one of these natural cycles, the heat would have to be coming from somewhere. It can't just create it out of nothing. That would violate conservation of energy. The biggest place where that heat could be coming from is the ocean. So rather than looking at temperature, we're going to look at the heat content. So if the heat content of the atmosphere is going up and the heat content of the ocean is going down, then that's why we're warming, right? We're just moving heat from the ocean up into the atmosphere. Here we go. I will label this so you know what you're looking at. The green is the increase in the heat content of the atmosphere and the land surface and the ice all put together, measured in exajoules. You don't even want to know how many exajoules that is. And the blue is how much heat is going into the ocean. Did you know that over 90% of the extra heat is going into the ocean? It's not just a natural cycle. The entire planet is warming up. Hang on, though, you might say. I know there's another type of natural cycle this type of natural cycle. And people say, you know, back in the 70s, didn't scientists say that another ice age was coming? Well, guess what? According to the Earth's orbit, because it's changes in the Earth's orbit around the sun that bring on the ice ages and then cause us to be in the warm periods like today, according to the changes in the Earth's orbit around the sun, you know where we are in that cycle? We're not still getting warmer after the last ice age. The warming after the last ice age peaked quite a few thousand years ago. Here is our Earth's temperature over the last 6,000 years. You know what was happening? We were slowly cooling. Ready to head into what? Another ice age. Not tomorrow, not in 100 years. It would take a few more thousand years. But we were ready to head into another ice age until something happened. So we know that it can't just be the sun because we'd be getting cooler right now, not warmer. It can't be a natural cycle like El Nino because the whole planet's warming. And it can't be the Earth's orbit because the next thing on that agenda was another ice age, not more warming. This is what we know. And that's why we also have even more confidence that the current warming we're seeing is because we are burning coal and gas and oil. We've been burning a lot of it ever since the Industrial Revolution. And we know how much we've been burning because we can measure it, right? Why do we care about this stuff? The reason why we care about these heat-trapping gases is because they're wrapping an extra blanket around the planet. Our planet already has a natural blanket that is made up of naturally occurring heat-trapping gases. And it keeps us just the perfect temperature for life. The Earth would be a frozen ball of ice if it weren't for this natural blanket. So what's the problem? The problem is, is that when we dig up and we burn all of this stuff, it is wrapping an extra blanket around the planet that it never needed. And imagine if you're sleeping at night and someone sneaks in and puts an extra blanket on you. What happens? Yeah, you start to heat up, you start to sweat. That's what we're doing to our planet. We're wrapping an extra blanket around the planet, and that is why it's warming up. And here is the crazy thing. You know how long we've known about this amazing natural blanket our planet has? Since this first guy over here. Now, these are the real people's pictures. This is not like some old-timey, you know, scientists of today dress up like. That is really how long we've known. How long have we known that coal and oil, when you burn them, produce more heat-trapping gases since the work of Tyndale in the 1850s? How long have we known how much the world would warm if we doubled or tripled levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere since Arrhenius did the calculations by hand in the 1890s? That's right, he built the first climate model by hand over 120 years ago. It took him two years to calculate how much the Earth would warm, and his calculations were amazingly similar to what we get today. Somewhere around Christmas during the first year, his wife left him. I take this very personally because I am also a climate modeler. 
But today we have computers, and so I set up my scripts to run on the computer, and then I go have dinner with my family. <laughs> and lastly, how long do you think it's been since we've actually been able to measure the impact that we are having on the temperature of our planet? Since Guy Callender, who published a paper in 1938. It is a fascinating read because it begins something along the lines of, you're never going to believe what I'm going to tell you, but I think you'll be convinced by the data I have to show you. <laughs> that was about 80 years ago. So the facts are climate is changing. It is us. And number three, it is bad, mostly bad. There's a couple of good things. There are a couple of good things. If you live way up north, it is getting warmer. But it's mostly bad. What type of bad? Well, here's kind of the problem. If you're writing a book about global warming, if you're making a movie about global warming, if you have a website about global warming, what's the one thing everybody wants to put on the cover? The polar bear. And if that's the only thing that we think is affected by climate change, which it is, then why should we take it that seriously? But the reality is, after the polar bear, we're next. How are we so vulnerable to a changing climate? Well, we have very variable weather. This is normal climate, and then this is Texas climate. <laughs> but what we don't realize is, is that all of our infrastructure, all of our buildings, all of our energy and water planning, all of our agriculture is built on the assumption that you can have hot and cold, wet and dry, but it's all going to average out in the end. That is the assumption that our entire society is built on. What happens if that assumption is no longer valid? 9 times out of 10, climate change is not bringing a bizarre plague of locusts like you've never seen before. 9 times out of 10, it is taking something you are very familiar with already and it is exacerbating it, putting it on steroids. Example. Hurricanes, a normal part of life in the Gulf of Mexico, they are getting stronger because of warmer ocean water. Remember how much more heat is going into the ocean? Over 90% of the total heat trapped by that extra blanket is going into the ocean. What's it doing there? It's powering stronger hurricanes. We've always had heat waves, but the heat waves are getting stronger. In Australia, they had to add a new color to their temperature map. That purple in the middle is 54 degrees Celsius. It's 129 Fahrenheit, and they used it again after they added it. Here in Texas, our rainfall is getting more extreme. Why? Because in a warmer world, water evaporates faster. Along comes a storm, there's more water vapor for it to pick up and dump on us. And similarly, when a natural drought comes along and it's hotter, water evaporates faster out of our lakes and reservoirs and streams and soils, and the droughts are longer and stronger as well. If you haven't seen The Years of Living Dangerously, I strongly encourage you to do that. The first season is all about real people who are being affected by a changing climate, and the first episode is right here in Texas. The second season, though, is hopeful. It's about the amazing solutions that there are around the world. Bottom line, though, is that we care about a changing climate because it exacerbates many of the risks we already face today. Here's the last thing. Climate is changing. Yes, it is us. It is bad. And I'm sorry to tell you this, we're lowballing you. A couple of years ago, my program director, very nice man, came up to me and he said, you know, Catherine, if you could just tell your colleagues to, you know, dial it down a bit. Tell them not to be quite so alarmist. I think more people would believe them. So I said to him, well, that's a very interesting thought. But the reality is, is that someone just beat you to this. Naomi Oreskes, who some of you might have known because she wrote The Merchants of Doubt, a great movie and great book if you haven't read or seen it yet, she did a study where she actually tested this. Skeptics of the reality and significance of human climate change have frequently accused us of being alarmist. Now, she's a conservative scientist, so by frequently she actually means twice a day. So you know what she and her colleagues did? They did something really smart. They took 20 years of predictions from 1990 to 2010 of all kinds of changes all around the world, 
glaciers melting, sea level rising, rainfall patterns changing. And then they compared those 20 years of predictions with what really happened. And I thought that they would find that there wasn't any bias because we are constantly as scientists striving to be unbiased. But that's not what they found. They found that we are biased. The available evidence, she said, suggests that we have been conservative and not conservative in a good way. Scientists are biased towards being cautious, where we define caution as erring on the side of less rather than more alarming predictions, and we, they even coined a syndrome. We call this erring on the side of least drama. Scientists hate drama. What we have to say is already bad enough. Why not just kind of dial it down a bit so we don't get shot in every other body part, not just the foot? So that's what we know, but now let's talk about what we think. A little different. Here is a, how many years is this now? 27 year Gallup poll on how much people are worried about global warming. Now this year, for the first time, we're actually back up above 60%. But for many, many, many years, we've been quite low on the scale. But you can't just divide people up into black and white, yes or no, this or that. This is why I think this, this study called the Six Americas of Global Warming is so brilliant, because it divides us all up into six different groups. And here's the fascinating thing. The two groups we hear the most from are two of the smallest groups, especially the dismissive group. Did you know that people who are truly dismissive, I love the word name dismissive, I, I like it much better than denier. Number one is it's not loaded, and number two is it really describes what dismissives are. Dismissives are people, here's my official definition. Dismissives are people who if an angel from God appeared in front of them with tablets of stone saying climate change is real in letters of flame, they would dismiss it. So heaven help you if you somehow think that any more scientific evidence will change their minds. It will not, but it will frustrate you and it will take up your time and energy and that is what they want, you to do, what, what they want to happen. Here's the good news though. Did you know that most people in the United States are cautious? Cautious, we can work with that. And actually a fair amount are concerned too. Now, at the same time as people are cautious and concerned, if you ask people around the country, is global warming mostly caused by human activities, any, anywhere that's blue is below 50%. Anywhere that's blue is below 50%. You say, well, what's the solution to this? Often, in fact, I get an email almost every week saying often, you know, Catherine, if you could just explain the science to so-and-so, I'm sure they would get it. Or if you could just help me explain the science to so-and-so, I know they would get it. I just saw a colleague on Facebook today explaining the science to somebody in hopes that he would get it. Here's the thing. That assumption is based on the idea that we're blank slates just waiting to have the right information written on us. In education, it's known as the knowledge deficit model, that people are willing and able to process information if it's available. We just need more information. So, what I love about social science, this is Dan Cahan. I like showing you pictures of people. So when I'm quoting them, you know what they look like. This is Dan. Dan wrote a study where he said, you know, I know that public apathy over climate change is often attributed to a deficit in comprehension. People don't know enough. And if you don't know enough, what is the solution? The solution is to write a set of IPCC reports back in 1990. And those weren't enough, so they wrote another set in 92 and 94, and then followed by another set in 95. Then there were the 2000s, the 2005s, and the most recent set of IPCC reports. But maybe those were international reports. We really need a national climate assessment, or two, or three, or number four, like we're writing right now. Oh, but those were government reports. How about a National Academy of Sciences report? Or another one, or another one. You get the picture. This is why I love this work so much, because Dan went on and said, we conducted a study. What a novel idea. And we found no support, none. In fact, people, get this, 
people with the highest amount of science literacy were not most concerned, they were the most polarized. Half and half. Isn't that crazy? So we aren't blank slates written to be, waiting to be written on with correct information. His work suggests that our public divisions don't stem from lack of information, but rather from, and here we're starting to loop back to where we began, from personal interest we have in forming beliefs in line with others with whom we share close ties. What types of close ties do we share with other people? Religion and money. politics and money. There you go. You see the circle is closing here. If we look in the United States, as I said before, just about, you know, there's 16% of people who do not belong to a specific faith, and the rest do. So that is why there is such a deliberate and intelligent attempt to make it part of our culture to reject this issue, because then we feel like we have to reject our culture and our very identity if we're going to accept the reality of a changing climate. That is why we see headlines like this. When we look at climate change concern levels in the United States and we divide them out by affiliation, we have all Americans and then we have, who's the most concerned people group? Anybody with really good eyesight, can you read that second line? Hispanic Catholics. And then anybody with really good eyesight, can you read the bottom line? Okay, this is where the wheels start to fall off the bus, <laughs> right? Because, forgive me, but I thought that Hispanic Catholics and white Catholics had the same pope. <laughs> and I kind of thought that he was this guy. And I also thought that this is just one of the things he said in the over 100-page encyclical that he wrote about climate change, yes or no? Yes. yes. Global warming is caused by enormous consumption of wealthy nations with repercussions in the poorest places on the planet. So is it being Catholic that makes people reject the reality of a changing climate? No. Is it being evangelical that makes them reject it? No. Here's where the social science comes in again. Another study, this one by a guy called John Evans, says it's true that conservative Protestants are less likely to believe in the conclusiveness of climate science. And here's John, of course I have a picture of him. But when you control for other demographic properties, going to church is not what causes this. The correlation and the causation is with age, political conservatism, and especially the Republican Party. Isn't that crazy? No. <laughs> and then this is a quote from a man who I think is, is awesome because he is actually the assistant director for the National Association of Evangelicals in the United States. You know what the National Association of Evangelicals did two years ago? They published a report on how important it is to care about climate change because it affects the poor. Yeah. And they get it, because this is what he said. He's, Galen says, many evangelicals do oppose action to slow climate, not on a religious basis, but politically. Why? Because they want, believe the government wants to take away their freedom. And it's true. When people often think of solutions, they think of legislative solutions and punitive solutions, like the government's going to tell me how to set my thermostat, or what type of car to drive, or how much water I can use. And who really wants the government telling them that? Not too many of us would be willing to put up with that if those are really the solutions. We get confirmation of this. This is my last favorite quote. This is a quote, if you notice the year, that was made in the same year as the previous one about it being a hoax. Do you realize, he said, I was actually on your side of this issue when I first chaired the Senate Environment Committee and I first heard about it. I was on your side until when? Until I opened the Bible? No. Until I went to church? No. Until I went to vote? No. I was on your side until I found out how much it would cost. 
Solution aversion is the problem. And I honestly don't know why they would want to do that to a donkey. But the reality is, is that nine times out of 10, if you are having a conversation with someone who is objecting to the science of climate change and the conversation lasts more than two minutes, you will take a U-turn down the road of solutions because that is the real problem that people have and that is why arguing the science will never fix the problem. What will fix the problem? Talking solutions that people can accept. Now, I'm going to show you a couple of crazy figures here. Ready? Remember, we looked at this one already. This is people who think global warming is mostly caused by humans or not. Remember, in the blue area is, is mostly not, right? Now, this is the same study, and they asked them some other questions, OK? Do you support funding research? Funding research. Who funds research? Government, with your taxes. Do you support funding research into renewable energy? Heck yes. I mean, look at those colors. We've got, you know, minimum 65%, some as high as, you know, 80 to 85% say absolutely. What about, do you support requiring utilities? Not asking them or suggesting, actually requiring, legislating. Yes. The entire country, over 50% says yes. And here next is the craziest map. Do you support regulating carbon dioxide as a pollutant? Now, again, remember, most people think it's not causing the planet to warm, OK? Do you support regulating it as a pollutant? Why do you support regulating it as a pollutant if you don't think it's causing climate to change? Could be the way they worded the question, but frankly, I don't care. If they support it, I'm all for regulating it. See what I mean? A lot easier to talk this than the science. So how can we move forward when it comes to climate? Not hauling out a ton of scientific reports and just slapping them down beside somebody and saying, we're going to go through this until you change your mind. That is not going to work. Absolutely not. I know it's tempting. Resist. The first thing we can do is we can acknowledge that it is a real problem affecting real people today. It is increasing our flood risk whether we live in South Texas or whether we live in Bangladesh. And we can talk about it. Each one of these things I'm going to show you is a talking point because you know what? One of the first and simplest things we can do is talk about this issue. Studies have shown we don't talk about it. Why? We're scared to. We don't know how to start. We think it will end in an argument. Try starting from the heart rather than the head. Try starting by talking about people who are being affected. Or talk about the awesome ways that we can prepare for a changing climate. Like conserving water by using in-ground irrigation instead of those pivot systems where half the water evaporates before it even gets to the ground. Or the Netherlands where they're coping with sea level rise by building floating villages. So when sea level goes up three feet, they go to the hardware store and they get three more feet of anchor chain. Talk about how exciting it is that wind energy is generating so many jobs in our state. Or that poor people in Africa, there's a billion people without electricity in the world. And just about all of those billion people live in places where they don't have coal deposits that they can use to burn like we did. Talk about how exciting it is that they're getting solar panels on their roof. Or that Elon Musk has invented these crazy shingles that are going to cost about the same as a normal roof, but they just look like normal shingles and they're solar panels. Who wouldn't like that? Yeah. Bloomberg is telling us that fossil fuels have lost the race. We're adding more capacity for renewable power every year than coal, oil, and gas combined. And this was two years ago. Yeah. What are we doing here in Texas? Georgetown is going 100% green, and they said, wait, they said it was primarily a price decision. Yeah. Double applause. <laughs> Fort Hood bought a new contract that's all solar and wind because they're going to save taxpayers $168 million. Yeah. 
Near San Antonio, they're taking oil patch workers who lost their job when prices went up, and they're retraining them to do solar installations. Yes! We can give ourselves a hand because we get about 20% of our wind energy from wind already and it's just going up. There's crazy good stuff happening in Texas. Now you might say, whoop, yep, somebody said, whoop, what about China, whoop. Did you know that China has more wind and solar capacity than any other country in the world now? Did you know that they're shutting down half-built coal plants in China? Did you know that they have cut their coal emissions and the reason why Carbon emissions are starting to decouple from economic growth for the first time since the 1700s is because of what's happening in China? Yeah. It's starting the world's biggest carbon market, and it said if the U.S. drops the ball on climate leadership, China will pick it up. I don't know about you, but if I were you, I would be slightly embarrassed. Just saying. What can we do? This is my latest global weirding video from this week. There's a lot of awesome stuff we can do. We can make little steps ourselves to save ourselves money too. We can talk about it to people. And one of the most important things we can do is we can make our voice heard. We can make our voice heard in our community where a church puts solar panels on its roof to serve as a garden for the community or little colleges are putting in solar arrays. And most of all, we can exercise our right as citizens of whatever country we belong to, to make our voice heard to our political leaders. Citizens Climate Lobby is one organization that does that, and they have chapters all around the country and in Canada and other countries around the world. If you feel like you don't know how to write a letter to, the, to an op-ed letter, or you don't know how to go talk to your local official, this organization can help. So there are many, many ways that we can get engaged, but the bottom line is despair and fear will not motivate us long term. We have to be motivated by hope for a better future and by love and care for each other. I want to close with a quote from my favorite scientist. As a little girl, I grew up watching her movies, Jane Goodall. Just this past year, she said this, it is only when our clever brain and our human heart work together in harmony that each of us can achieve our full potential.